Hello, my name is Keshwani. It's K E S H W A N I. Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GRE. We have been solving GRE math problems out of this book here, the official guide to the revised GRE, the second edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. We are finished. We are almost finished solving all the problems from this book. If you're interested in watching the solutions to any of the math problems, you will find the solution from day number 251 through 400. This book contains almost all the same problems and in most cases exactly on the same page numbers as the ones that appeared in the first edition of the revised GRE. We have finished every single math problem from here. In the event that you are interested in watching the original solutions to the problems, you will find the original solutions from day number one through 250. Original, day number one through 250. Original problems tend to be a little bit lengthy, they little bit, little bit, they tend to be a little bit in depth. Right now, we are in the process of solving quantitative comparison question, quantitative comparison questions out of this book here, the 10th edition of the general GRE, the old version, because the other two books that I just showed you simply do not contain enough quantitative comparison questions. Quantitative comparison questions are still present in the new exam, the revised GRE, and they are a big chunk of the exam to so get some extra practice. From day number 401, we started solving quantitative comparison question, and right now we are on page number 200, and seven. Please turn to it. Page number 207, problem number 10, the penultimate problem, the second to the last problem on the page. Let's take a look at it. Let's take a look at it. I need to free fix this thing because I keep erasing, uh, I keep forgetting to, to take care of it. Quantitative quantity quantity Quantitative comparison. Question number 10. I am so paranoid, I'm not sure if I spelled it correctly. Alright, problem number 10. Problem number 10, when it was given in the real exam, 64% of the people got it right, about a third of the people missed it. Here's the problem, it's a geometry question. We are given a triangle here. A, B, and C. We are told that this is 30 degrees and what we are being asked to compare in column A, we have the length of AB. In column B, we have a length of BC. Let's see what we can do, shall we? Well, if, if this is 30 degrees, which it is because we are told it is 30 degrees, if it turns out that this angle is also 30 degrees, angle C, if if it turns out, if it turns out that angle C is 30 degrees, if it turns out the angle C is 30 degrees, then this is 30 degrees, this is 30 degrees, it's an isosceles triangle, this side will equal to this side. In which case, AB will equal BC, in which case the answer would be C. On the other hand, if it turns out that this angle is more than 30 degrees, if it's 40 degrees, let's say, if, if it turns out that angle C is more than 30 degrees, then we know that the larger angle will force face a larger side. Larger angle, the larger angle will face a larger side. In a triangle, in a triangle, the opposite sides and angles are proportional. We know that. In a triangle, in a triangle, opposite sides and angles are proportional. Meaning that the largest side faces the largest angle, the smallest side faces the smallest angle. So if this happens to be 40 degrees, then the side AB, in this case the side AB, if, if angle C happens to be more than 40 degrees, this symbol is for angle and this angle is greater than sine. Say angle, if angle C happens to be more than 30 degrees, then AB would be longer than BC. In which case the answer would be A. As far as the exam is concerned, we are done. We are done because we are getting complete answer, the answer is D. Let's look at one more scenario here. If it turns out that if angle C, if angle C is less than 30 degrees, let's say the angle C is only 10 degrees. If angle C is only 10 degrees, if angle C happens to be only 10 degrees, then of course 10 degrees will face a very small side, in which case AB would be less than BC. 
in which case the answer would turn out to be B. And because we are getting conflicting answers, the answer is D. The answer is D because we don't know what this angle is. Without knowing angle C, without angle knowing angle C, we cannot compare AB versus BC. We have to know the measurement of angle C and there is no way in this problem to figure out the measurement of angle C because we don't know what angle B is. That's all. The answer is D. Let's move on then. Next problem. Problem number 11. Problem number 11. By the way, before, before I completely erase it, a thought crosses my mind, so I will share with you for whatever it's worth. Okay, just let me get my pointer so I can speak. In a triangle, it says, it says, in a triangle, opposite sides and angles are proportional. They are proportional, but they are not, they are not strictly proportional. Not strictly proportional. Do you understand? What does it mean for two variables to be strictly proportional? What we mean here, what we mean here by saying that they are not strictly proportional, opposite sides and angles are not strictly proportional. What we mean here is this. Say for example, let's take a very simple scenario, a very simple case of a 30-60-90 triangle. As we can clearly see, as we can clearly see, this side is the smallest side. Let's call it A, B, C. A, B, C, this side, A, B, uh, this side, A, C is the smallest side that we can clearly see. The smallest side will face the smallest angle, will face the smallest angle. Let's say that this is 30 degrees. The largest angle here is this angle, which is the right angle, which is 90 degrees, which is the largest angle. In a right angle triangle, 90 degrees is the largest angle. And that angle will face the largest side. A, B to C is the largest side. And, and here, this is 60 degrees. This would have to be 60 degrees. If this is 30, this would have to be 60 degrees. And that's the medium size. It will face the medium size, which is A, B. What we're trying to point out is that the largest angle faces the largest side, the smallest the smallest angle faces the smallest side, angle B faces the ang angle, angle B faces side AC, which is this, which is the shortest side, because angle B is the smallest angle, and angle angle A faces side BC, which is the longest side, because it's the hypotenuse. They are proportional. The opposite sides and angles are proportional, but they are not, pro which means that if up, up opposite side and angles are proportional, which means the largest side faces the largest angle, the smallest side faces the smallest angle. They are proportional, but they are not strictly proportional. And this is what we mean by strictly proportional. Okay, I'm going to erase all of this thing so that we have some room to talk about. Oh, let's just start from scratch. What we mean by strictly proportional is that if this is 30 degrees and if you're told the side a, B, C. If we are told that A to, a to C is one, 1 inch, and if this is 60 degrees, and if we are told that A to B is 2 inches, then this side, B to C, since 30 degree faces 1 inches and 60 degree faces 2 inches, you might think that it's logical to conclude that if 30 degree faces 1 inches and 60 degree faces 2 inches, then 90 degree, 90 degree angle should face 3 inches. But of course we know that hypotenuse is not 3. In this case, in this triangle, hypotenuse is not 3. Largest angle does face the largest side. They are proportional, but they are not strictly proportional. Because if they were strictly proportional, then if 30 degree faces 1 inch, one inch long side, and 60 degree faces, uh, faces 2 inches long side, then the side that faces 90 degrees should be 3 inches long. But it's not. This side, of course, we know is going to be square, square root of 1 squared plus 2 squared is going to be square root of 5. This is this side is of course square root of 5. Do you understand? That's what we mean. They are not strictly proportional. They are proportional, but they are not strictly proportional. Anyway, let's go on to the next problem. Enough of the talk. Oh, by the way, I have a side note here. Do you know how much, how much square root of 5 is approximately? We just we talked about square root of 5. If you had to approximate during the exam, if you had to get some feel for it as to where it is, do you know approximately what, what the value is, what value is square root of 5? Do you know how much, how much square root of 3 is approximately? Do you know how much square root of 2 is approximately? I don't want you to go around memorizing these things. You have to know these values, but at the same time, I don't want you to go around memorizing these things. I want you to understand the concepts behind them. And you might wonder, well, what is there to understand? What, what concept is he talking about? Well, there is something that I want you to, I want you to learn, and I want you to understand the intuitive reason, uh, intuitive uh, feeling for what these values are. And what I would like you to do, if you're in, uh, in, interested in learning the square values of these numbers, 
intuitively that is, instead of simply memorizing it mechanically. What I would like you to do is watch this video here. It should say T is day 3. Just type in very simple tag. Just type in T's T E A S day 3 along with my name if you like. Teas as in tea that you drink. T E A S. Don't worry about what it is. No, it's no concern of yours right now. Just type in the tag T is day 3. A video will pop up. Watch that video and if it does not pop up then try T is day 3. Keshwani and then we'll watch that video and learn it. It will say in the title, in the title of the video it will say approximate value of root 2, 3 and 5. Do you understand? Let's do the next problem. Enough of the talk. Number 11. Number 11, the percentile is 75. We are told that the net income, net income in terms of x in terms of x which is the net, net income net income in terms of x which is the number of items sold is given by the expression x squared plus x minus 380 x squared plus x minus 380 this expression here when you put in when you when you put when you when you put in the value of x which represents the number of units that are sold or produced number of units sold it will give you how it will tell you how much profit you're making at that at, at that sell, uh, sales level do you understand the question is this the number of items that must be sold column a is number of items that must be sold for net income to equal zero and in column B and in column B we have 10 10 versus the number of items that this firm must sell in order for their net income to be zero. I want you to pause the video at this point, solve the problem yourself and then continue after you've done the problem yourself. I'll give you two seconds to do just that, to pause and unpause. Well first thing first, what does it mean when we say net income is equal to zero? Is there, is there, a, is there a term for it, for this concept? How do we articulate, how do we, how do we uh, uh, express the notion of a situation where a firm is generating a net income of zero? What do we call when we are making zero income? We are not making any loss, but at the same time we are not making any profit. Our net income is zero. We are not losing any money, we are not making any money. What is it called? Well, of course it's called, it's called the break-even point. That, by the way, was just a side note. It's, it has nothing to do with the problem. That's what it is. It's a break-even point. So that's what we have to figure out. What is the break-even point? Now listen very carefully, very carefully here. One way to solve this problem, the classical way, the orthodox way, the traditional way, the academic way, the algebraic way, is to actually set up, set up this expression, which is a very straightforward, which may seem very straightforward and logical way to do, which is to set up this expression equal to zero and solve this quadratic equation. Very straightforward very simple way to do it and let's do it very quickly just for, for just for learning purposes and then at the end we'll talk about what we actually should have done so let's set it up so we're looking for two numbers when we so that when we multiply them we get negative 380 we're looking for two numbers such that when we multiply them we get negative 380 and when we add two numbers when we add these two numbers we get a positive one we get a positive one and you think of two number two such numbers so that when we multiply them we get 380 when we when we add them we get positive 1. In other words, we are looking for the factors of 380. We are looking for factors of 380. Now if you go this way to figure out the factors of 380, you will be there forever. The smart thing to do if you are looking for factors of 380, if you are looking for factors of 380, the smart thing to do is to break it up into two parts, 38 and 10. 38 and 10. 
divide this by 2. How many 2's in a 3? 3 has 1 2. The remaining one goes and joins the 8, becomes 18. How many 2's in 18? 18 has 9 2's. So we get 2 times 19 equals 38, which makes perfect sense. And here we have 10, which can be broken up. Actually, we don't have to break it up. That's it. We are done. The two numbers that we're looking at, the two numbers that we're looking for, where can I put it? I need the room. The two numbers, the two numbers that we're looking for are such that, such that when we when we multiply them, when we multiply them, we get negative 380. And when we add them, we get positive 1. Can you find what those two numbers are? They are right there in front of you. The two numbers are 19, 19 and 2 times 10. 2 times 10 is 20. There you go. 20 times 19 is 380. Now we need, a, we need a negative sign here which means we have to decide whether the negative goes here or negative goes here. And that will come from the fact that when we add them we get a positive 1. We need, we need a positive 1 which means the larger number has to be positive. There you go. Positive 20 and a negative 19 will give us positive 1. Do you understand? So that's how we're going to break it up. Let's do it on the top because we need the room obviously. Let's do it on the top. So x squared plus x minus 380 equals 0 which means x squared plus 20x minus 19x minus 380 equals 0 if you look at these two terms if you look at these two terms we can take out the factor of x common and we get x plus 20 x plus 20 because obviously x times x gives us x squared and x times 20 is going to give us our 20x now we look at these two factors, negative 19 and negative 380, we can take out negative 19. Once we take out negative 19, we are left with x from here. And once we take out the negative, this negative comes out, it becomes positive. And 380 divided by 19 is positive 20. Zero. Now we look at this part here, x plus 20 is a common, part, common factor in these two quantities. We take those out. We take those out, x plus 20 and x minus 19 equals 0. That implies that x has to be either negative 20. That implies that either, either x plus 20 has to be 0 or x minus 19 has to be 0. Because we have two quantities. We have two quantities, x plus 20 and x minus 19. And we are told that the product of these two quantities is 0. If the product of two quantities is 0, if a times b is 0, then either a is equal to 0 or b is equal to 0, or perhaps they are both 0. That's what it is. Either x plus 20 is equal to 0, or x minus 19 is equal to 0, or they are both equal to 0. If x plus 20 is equal to 0, that implies that x is equal to negative 20, and, or x is equal to positive 19. Voila. Because we are talking about the number of units sold, we are talking about how many units the company needs to sell in order for them to break even, we cannot sell negative 20 units. We cannot sell negative 20 units, so the negative root is of no consequence to us. The answer is, they need to sell 19 units to break even. They need to sell 19 units to break even. And the problem was, problem was like this. Here was the column, column A, here was the column B. Here we had number of units, number of units to break even, and here we had 10. We just found another number of units they need they need to sell in order to break even is 19. So we have 19 versus 10. The answer is A. There you go. Okay. Now, the next part that we're going to do is very important, very vital. So I want you to pay close attention. If this is the kind of work that you did when you were solving the problem yourself, if this is the kind of problem that you did here, when you were doing the problem yourself, then I'm sorry to have to tell you, I'm sorry to have to inform you that you're still not getting the bloody point of the whole thing. These questions are called quantitative comparison. Quantitative comparison, which is why we make a point of writing down the word computation and crossing it out for emphasis. Nobody is asking us to compute anything. What was the question here? The question here was not, the question here was not, what is the break-even point. That was not the question. The question was, this was the question. Let's put the question one more time. Okay, remember the two rules that we found were, uh, well, the two rules we found were x is equal to negative 20, 
and x is equal to positive 20, positive 19. We are not interested in negative 20, so we are looking at positive 19. We can erase all of this thing, it's gone. I'll give you a second to give you unobstructed view here. Oh, here was the question. The question was this. Actually, it's right here. Column A, number of units to break even. Column B, 10. So what is this question asking? If you look at this question, column A says, how many, number, how many units do you need to sell to break even versus 10? What is this question asking? This question is not asking how many actually units do you need to sell to break even. That is not the question. The question here is, do we need to sell less than 10? Rather, fewer than 10 would be proper English. Do we need to sell fewer than 10 or more than 10 or exactly equal to 10 units to break even? Which is a very different question than how many we need to sell. Let's do, let's do this question one more time. Here is column A. Here is column B. Uh, break number of units, number of units to break even. And this is 10. And the expression that was given to us was x squared plus x minus 380 equals to 0. I believe that, that's what it was. Okay, now listen what what happened. Pay, pay very close attention. All we have to do is this. Okay, watch how simple this is. This question we, that we have been at it for like last 10 minutes should take actually in real exam, in real exam, without exaggeration, should not take more than 30 seconds. 30 seconds is being too generous. It should take about 10 seconds. This is what we have to understand. If you were to put 10 in here, 10 squared plus 10, 10 squared plus 10 is 110. 110 minus 380, my God, that's a very, very large negative number. We're not going to break even with 10 units. That implies that we need to sell, this implies we need to sell, we need to sell, we need to sell more than 10 units to break even. We are done. That's it. That was it. We need to sell more than 10 units to break even. We need to sell more than 10 units. How many more than 10 units? We really don't care. We need to sell more than 10 units. This is how we write more than 10 units. 10 with a plus sign on the top. We need to sell, we need to sell more than 10 units to break even. This is 10. The answer is A. That's what we have done. We didn't have to waste our time to actually figure out the break even point. That was not the bloody question. Do you understand? That was not the bloody point. We wasted all that time for no reason. And that is not something we can do in the real exam. We're going around uh, sp spending, uh, using our time in such uh, stupid, idiotic manner. Do you understand? Now, had it been a multiple choice question, it would have been a different question. So we'll do the same question in the multiple choice form in a second, okay? Just, just to play with you. We're going to do the same exact question in a multiple choice form, and then we'll learn a couple of other tricks. Just one thing at a time. What if, what if instead of 10, what if instead of 10, had they put 11 here? Well, same exact thing. Same exact thing. Instead of 10, we would put 11 here. 11 squared plus 11 squared. 11 squared is 121. 121 plus 11 is nowhere close to 380. It is still a negative quantity. That implies that we need to sell more than 11 units. We need to sell more than 11 units to break even. We need to sell more than 11 units to break even. Answer is still A. What if they had put 15 here? What if they had put 15 here? Well, same exact thing. Put 15 in here. Put 15 in here. 15 squared is 225. You have to know your squares by heart. 15 squared is 225. 225 plus 15 is only 240. 240 minus 380 is still a very large negative number. We are nowhere close to breaking even. Even 15 is not enough to break even. Even if you were to sell 15 units, you will still lose money. This implies that we need to sell more than 15 units. And of course, we know how many we need to sell. We need to sell 19. We already have done the work. But this is not something we should have known in the exam. This, 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 this bit of information is something that, should be, that we should have never wasted our time to learn. That was a waste of time. This bit of information, we paid a large amount of, a large sum of money for it, well, large, large, large sum of time for it, uh, to buy it. But we have no use for that information. This is worthless information. We really don't care what the break-even point. We just have to realize that it is more than 15. The break-even point is more than 15. So even if they had put 15 in the second column, the answer would still have been A. You understand? Now let's do the same problem very quickly, very quickly in a multiple choice form. So in a multiple choice column form, they would say, they would say, what is the 
break even point for this expression x squared plus x minus 380. But of course in the exam they will make it very elaborate, they will, make, they will use too many fancy words and make it same question, they will make it into a three or four line question. But the bottom line, the nub of the question is, what's the break even point? The nub of the question is, what's the break even point? Let's find out, shall we? Here are the answer choices. A, B, C, D, and E. What does nub mean? When did we learn the word nub? Did we learn the word nub in our vocabulary lessons? I hope we did. I hope we did. The nub of the question, nub of the question is what we put down on the blackboard. In the real exam, it will be very verbose. Do you understand? Day number 11. Just type in GRE vocabulary words. Just type in GRE vocabulary words. Day 11 and learn that word nub. The essence, the gist, the main idea, the main theme, the main focus of the problem is what's the break even point? Let's find out. Here are the answer choices. I'm going to give you some answer choices here. How about we make up some here? 10, 15, 18, 19, and 20. A, B, C, D, and E. 10, 15, 18, 19, and 20. Okay? Now listen and understand as to how to tackle this problem even, even if it were to come in the real in, in the real exam in the multiple choice form instead of a quantitative to comparison form even in the multiple choice form we would not actually waste our time to solve the bloody equation like we just did to figure out the actual rules that is not necessary that is not necessary you would just play around with the answer choices it only takes few seconds it only takes a matter of two or three seconds to realize that 10 is too small it's just too small 10 squared plus 10 is nowhere close to 380 we just did that Similarly, we have to look at 15 and realize that 15 is too small. 15 squared plus 15 is only 240. It is nowhere close to 380. We need to find out, we have to set this equation to zero. Break-even point means that the net income has to be zero. Question is, what's the break-even point? Which, is, which means, what's the net, uh, well, how much do you need to produce in order for the net income to be zero? And net income is given by this expression. So we set up this expression equal to zero and we solve this equation. As you can see, 15 squared is 225, 225 plus 15 is 240, it is nowhere close to 380. 15 is too small, 10 is too small, 15 is too small. I'm not going to worry about 18 and 19 because 18 and 19 is a very cumbersome calculation. I'm looking for the easy answer choice right now. Uh, easy answer choices right now. Do you understand the numbers that are easy to work with? The next number that I see that is easy to work with is 20. Watch what happens. If we do 20 in here, we are immediately able to say that 20 is too large. 20 squared is 400, 400 plus 420. 4 plus 20 is 420 minus 380. Here, here we'll have a profit of $40. We don't want to make a profit of $40. We want to have a, or rather profit of, yes, profit of $40. We don't want to make a profit. We're looking for the break-even point. That's too large. The answer has to be 18 or 19. Are you still with me in the story? Because we are, we are getting, we are getting very close to the payoff. We're getting very close to the payoff. Okay, watch what happens. So we're done with it. The answer has to be either 18 or 19. Are you with me still? Watch what happens. If you were to put 18 in here, 18 squared plus 18. 18 squared plus 18. Okay, listen to me. 18 squared, what will be the unit digit of 18 squared? Do you understand the question? The unit digit of 18 squared, if you were to multiply 18 times 18, what's going to be the unit digit here? But unit digit is going to be 4, because it's 8 times 8 is 64. The unit digit is 4. And then to which we add 18. To which we add 18. I don't know what 18 squared plus 18 squared is, but it is not going to end in a 0. It's going to end in a 2. It's going to end in a 2. And if it ends in a 2, we cannot possibly have a 0 because this guy ends in a 0. Do you see that? It must be 19. It must be 19 because 19 squared 19 squared is 19 times 19, which is going to end in a 1, because 9 times 9 is 81, to which we add 19 more to it, and voila, we get a 0, we get a 0, not that 0, rather, that's not what, we, what I meant, we get a 0, that means that this amount, this amount would have to be 380, because 380 minus 380 will get into the 0. This amount ends in a 2, something that ends in a 2, this quantity, if it ends in a 2, something that ends in a 2, minus something that ends in a zero is not going to end in a zero. 
I'll see you tomorrow, okay? Bye now.